With us right now, Representative Brenda Lawrence. She is with the 14th Congressional District. Always great to have you on the show. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much and good to be here. So obviously, uh, top of the list, one o'clock this afternoon, the uh, Trump trial continues. Mm -hmm. We've talked to you about this before, but any other things that you want to add about the impeachment trial? Because, of course, some people on the other side say the Republicans are not going to vote to to convict if even that's the proper term I, i'm not sure about that but so why take the time in the middle of a pandemic i uh, when i took my oath of office to serve and protect i never thought i would be under an attack uh, being on the floor when this happened being told to seek cell shelter <clears throat> excuse me seek shelter to put on a gas mask to have police with guns drawn rushing us out of the room to hear a mob banging on the door saying, you know, open the doors, who's in here, we're coming in. And to later, you know, thank God I didn't see all the clips while I was going through this, I had no idea how massive it was. And to know that a mob was walking through the White House saying, hang Pence, who was the vice president of the United States of America. When I ran out of that room, it wasn't just Democrats. It was the Republicans and Democrats together. Pence is a Republican. And so this was an anti-government movement. They did not care if you were Democrat or Republican, they had one mission, and that was to stop us from certifying the votes. Now, everyone knows that in America, we have laws and we have rules and you cannot destroy property. You cannot kill people. And people seem to want to minimize this. Five people died. We had police officers beating other police officers with flagpoles. This was one of the most horrific days in our day of history. And the fact that you have, the fact that you had two or three weeks to go in your elected period of service does not exempt you from a criminal act. I feel it was criminal. I, I do want to say that in our constitution, there is the impeachment process. The president of the United States assembled an army, assembled, and then directed this group of people to go to the Capitol and to tell them to fight like hell. And they did. And there has to be, if it were you or I, if I'm in a car with someone and they drive up to a bank and rob the bank, I'm an accessory because I knew what you were going to do. I'm an accessory to the crime. This, we have laws and no one is exempt from the law. And we've had people convicted of uh, being with someone as an accessory and not even knowing exactly. what their intent was at, at the time. So, uh, but with that, you, you know, we're from Michigan and uh, we can go back and forth. And we've talked before about how they did not know this was coming because, you know, as, as you know, I work for a federal law enforcement agency. Mm -hmm. We have ways to track some of these threats. Um, but with that, here in the state of Michigan, the growing concern about these threats and the militia in Michigan. Let's think about Timothy McVeigh. Mm -hmm. This is nothing new for us. Mm -hmm. um, so are you concerned as someone who represents the state of Michigan that this could actually fuel more of the militia movement within our state? You know, I always question those who say that, you know, we need a militia in our country. That when the law said that you need to arm yourself to because, you know, the government may be overthrown. That was before we had armies. That was before we had a military. It was before we had police departments. And now if you feel that um, something is wrong, we have courts, we have laws, we have military, we have law enforcement. And so we every day exercise our democracy. 
I don't know what motivates um, individuals to be anti-government. To give you an example, in that mob, there were police, mm -hmm. military, firefighters, um, parents, and they were anti-government. They weren't there on a mission or a call saying we want to um, stop you from building in, in, in the uh, in, in ocean drilling. It wasn't a cause, it was to overthrow the government. And this is what is so difficult to understand is that how can the person who represent the government send a mob to the Capitol to take over the same government that they took an oath of office to serve and protect? That is challenging for me. But when we look at, in Michigan, there's so many good people. There are so many amazing people. I had, when I ran for Lieutenant Governor, opportunity to go all over this state in the UP and upper Michigan and West East, you name it, Southern part. It was, this is a great state of great people. And um, I always believe that good overweighs the bad. And uh, I'm still hopeful for America and for Michigan. I do get concerned about some of the people that say uh, this is a freedom of speech. And when we take people off some of the more popular platforms, are they going underground? And does it, will that make it harder for them to track or also individuals that were maybe just <clears throat> had some you know, certain thoughts, but now they're connected with these extremists because they feel like they can't talk about certain things in public. And uh, that I think that's my concern. And uh, you worry that uh, could this be a bigger movement that grows out of this? Let's hope not. Let's hope like the Jeep commercial <laughs> in the Super Bowl that we meet in the center and we yes. all start to get along, right? Yeah. And, and even the UP, we love you, UP. And Jeep is sorry they, they didn't include you. <laughs> I am uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Um, the fact that, and to get back to your point you made on the last question, I don't understand how the, how the, the intelligent community, intelligence community were not aware because this had been played out and brought up in daylight and open social media. There was no surprise, but an investigation is being held. As you saw, there were police, um, military, all involved in this. And when you look at the Capitol Police, they were told not to to stand up. They were told to stand down. All kinds of directions and so many levels played into this anti-government murderous riot. And we cannot have a government or a democracy if what we saw continues. And so everyone, if they were asleep, they have been awakened. Uh, we do have freedom of speech. There's one thing to talk to someone and say, you know what? I think Brenda's an idiot and she should go somewhere and sit down. It's another thing to come to my door, break it down, ram my home and, and to try to harm me. And that's what we saw. We didn't see speech, we saw mm -hmm. action. And I hope everyone realizes and it's amazing to me that we're talking about free speech when you had destruction, you had death, you had violence, you had all of these things rolled into one. This was bigger than freedom of speech. Yeah, and I, but you know, you've been around long enough. Um, I will say my biggest education for working a, with a federal law enforcement agency as someone who came from the media was the level of politics involved in our law enforcement agencies and not just on a federal level, this happens on a state and a local level as well. And the person who is sitting at the top of the food chain, they help dictate the policy. Mm -hmm. So we knew under Trump that the U.S. attorney's offices, they were looking for gun crimes because they wanted to get their stats up mm -hmm. about going after gun crimes. So when you're, we're talking about uh, the intelligence with our, you know, with our law enforcement agencies, a lot of them had the intelligence, 
but it's it's that political sway within our law enforcement that I think it needs effort needs to be made to remove that mm -hmm. so that these law enforcement agencies can act um, with regard for the best interests of the public and not so concerned about their next job. Well, I know, and I'm a, I'm happy to hear that Secretary Austin who took over as the Secretary of Defense has already launched an internal investigation on politicization and of the military. Um, just think about, it. we train our military to fight. We train our military to destroy, to have intelligence and to have them to go against our government. You know, these same people who were carrying this flag was attacking the government that this flag represent. They're the ones who take the oath, of, I mean, the Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And to want to overthrow and take actions to overthrow our government is something that we know in history, we lived through that and we fought and we won. Um, I, I just feel strongly that this is a, a wake up moment in our country we never thought in the 21st century of our country that we would have um, a rebellion against our government. Well, it's great that you said that because it, it really is about, hey, how do we bridge the gap from this point on? Representative Brenda Lawrence here with us. She's the uh, U.S. Representative for Michigan's 14th Congressional District. Um, I, obviously, right now, by the way, uh, we do want to say congratulations on being named vice chair of the House Thank of you. Appropriations Committee. It, but it's like all these years later, sometimes I feel like um, a Washington politics it's still like the old boys club. Do you feel like that? Um, or it, is the tide changing? Oh, the tide is absolutely changing. Um, the women who are in leadership chairs of committee, I am the co-chair of the Women's Caucus. I was the chair of the entire congressional uh, body Women's Caucus. And we fight for issues and make sure that we are engaged in uh, policies, laws. To give you an example, during this pandemic, we found when you talk about poverty and needing resources, the number one, um, the number one group or the largest group in poverty in America are women head of households, single women head of households. We find that childcare is a major deterrent to assembling wealth because I had a town hall on childcare and a father wrote and said, I pay more money, Congresswoman, more money to childcare than I do for my mortgage. So when you think about in America, how we don't pay attention to childcare, we, we look at hunger and you think about it, like they're talking about, well, you shouldn't get any money if you make 60,000 or 50,000. If I'm a single person, I can live, I can make it on 50,000. But if I have four children to feed and I have 50,000, four children to, to uh, pay a water bill for, pay housing for, because I can't live in a, uh, a single um, studio apartment. I have to get something with extra bedrooms. I have to have water. I have to have food. I have to have clothing. And you think about all the cost of that. And so when we use our voices and it's over 130 women now in Congress, you may say out of 435, that's not a lot, but it's the largest we've ever had. And so I'm very, uh, I'm very proud of the women in leadership, you know, Nancy Pelosi, um, um, McCain and the Republicans. And the Republicans, for the first time, they have over 20 women on the Republican side. They were the most they ever had before this term was 13. So we are moving in the right direction. And um, I feel good about it, uh, the place that women are in and growing in Congress. You know, and thank you for taking that on as well. It's funny, I was having a conversation with uh, several other women the other day, and we were talking about how some, sometimes women in business 
we're not our biggest champions. Like yeah. we compete against one another when we should be lifting one another up. And there was a recent study that showed that the pandemic is going to take the women's movement in business so many steps back. And a lot of that has to do with childcare because people are having to choose, hey, who's going to stay home with our kids? Uh, Because, you know, not every job is remote. And if you can't be a remote, uh, you someone has to take care of the kids that are five, six, seven years old, you can't leave them home alone. And so it's great to have people such as yourself to be an example, but also an inspiration to say that we can achieve this, uh, but to recognize the challenges that as women in the workforce that we face as well. So thank you with that. Um, So if we can, um, uh, Biden's Buy American Order, Mm -hmm. what does that actually mean for the state of Michigan? For, For the state of Michigan, we are a manufacturing state. And it boosts, it boosts U.S. manufacturing and federal purchases of U.S. made products and goods. It is amazing to me, people who will say, no one's fighting for my job. Uh, they're sending my jobs and they buy foreign made cars. Here in Michigan, if you're not sensitive to the fact that when you buy foreign cars, you're creating an industry away from America. I am very much by American. I look for that U.S. tag on products. Unfortunately, there are items we can't make here. And so one of the things that Biden administration will do is to to, um, take a tougher line on waivers or uh, exemptions that allow federal agencies to make purchases of federal of foreign goods. And he using the Defense Act um, to uh, make sure that um, like the Defense Department is not using our dollars to buy oil and steel out in other countries. And the Buyback Better, uh, which is the platform of Biden, uh, he's going to support U.S. manufacturing and jobs. And no one knows that better than in Michigan. And I, I wanted to just bring up some statistics for those who say, why are you guys always talking about women? Do you realize that Detroit's comeback was based on small businesses and women owned businesses has been the largest number of small businesses in our economy. In addition to that, black women hold the highest level of student debt in America. And we in America die from childbirth at a rate higher than uh, third world countries. There are so many issues that we need to talk about and not to mention the uh, raising the minimum wage because women are the ones who work in those low paid jobs, those tip wage jobs, which we know now are you couldn't live on because there's no one there to tip. So women have a lot of issues that we have to address. And it, it is, and we need to continue that conversation, but um, I know that your time is valuable and we always appreciate that you take time for us, but before we go, we have to talk about the vaccine it, it, because it is such a big part. I think 2021 is really going to be about the vaccine. Mm-hmm. It was funny, 2020, we were talking about the test. Yes. Right? Where can you get the test? Uh, how fast are they being and you know administered and processed and how accurate? Now 2021 is about the vaccine. Uh, Good news, Myers just came out and said that they will start today as part of the pharmacy um, program. Uh, They'll start administering this. It does seem as if sometimes when government gets in the way, we've been doing the flu vaccine for how many years? And I know there are different hoops and there are different rules and regulations, plus just the storage on this one. Uh, But we know we can roll out vaccines. We've been doing it forever, but now we have, it goes from the federal to the state, to the county, down to the individual. It seems like there are so many layers of government getting in the way of getting the vaccine to the people that need it. So we're figuring this out. We're flying the plane and trying to build it at the same time. Um, There has been some glitches. I will tell you what my message is and what I'm fighting for is that we allow the states, every state, and there's 50 of them, 
to develop their own distribution plan. I feel strongly that for seniors, it should be a federal rollout. It's too much to ask the senior uh, to figure out the internet, to schedule an appointment, to then, some of them don't have transportation to get there, to um, navigate through all of that because every state is doing it different. We have people crossing state lines to get the vaccine. It should be a federal rollout for our seniors and then let the state figure it out for those who have you know, the ability. And then there's some who are um, in hot spots and areas where the, the virus has been very prominent <coughs> who do not have internet. And we have to have internet to schedule the appointment. So there's so many things we need to work on. But thank God we're looking at J&J &J now. And hopefully that one shot will be approved. It hasn't as of yet. And once we get three of these vaccines going and we get the production up, we'll be rocking and rolling. If we get this thing right by June, we should be in a much better place. And thank you for recognizing uh, the uh, hurdles that so many people in the senior community are facing right now, because like you said, a lot of them, it's transportation and it's the internet. Mm -hmm. And we keep telling people, go online, go, go online. Well, so yeah. many people can't do that. So thank you for recognizing that. Um, a, a couple more minutes here with you before we let you go. Anything maybe we didn't touch on in the interview that you want to share with our audience before we say goodbye? I want people to know, you know, I tell people I lived through the three eyes, the insurrection, the impeachment, and then the inauguration. We had a peaceful transfer of power with all the broken glass, with all of the memories and deaths that happened on the 6th. We're still a democracy. We're still a country. And you know what? I have to do my job because I took the oath of office and i I promise you I will continue to do that. I know that we have to work together. I have to hear the people who scaled those walls that day. What is it that made you want to, to take over or destroy your government? Because I have a responsibility to serve. And I want people to know that our government is still intact, that we have to work up together. And if I don't agree with you, let's just debate it or talk about it. We don't have to be violent. And I want, I want the next generation to have that hope of one nation under God. And that everything that is amazing about being an American only happens when we work together and stay true to our democracy. And I'm hopeful. That is such a good message because democracy is important. Um, it is what we are based on. Mm -hmm. And that is the foundation of our country. But uh, not only that, when you invite these people to speak, it's also to hear what they're saying. Yes. Because I will say I have people on both sides. I'm an independent and I have people on the far right and the far left. Mm -hmm. And right now is not always a good time to talk with some of these people because and no one can listen and we need people to be able to come together and open their hearts and to listen because at the end of the day, we all share the same breath. So thank you for being with us. We always appreciate your time and your uh, dedication to serving our community, uh, community as well. Thank you so much. You stay safe and I hope soon we'll be able to see each other in person. <laughs> 